Check, check. Okay, I'm on. Um, well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone, and hope you guys enjoyed this event so far. I'm going to talk to you about some piece of work that I did a while back on how I basically built well, my greatest social network to run pretty much entirely on serverless. So my name is Yan Chui. I'm actually one of the AWS community heroes that focuses around the serverless space. So I'm an independent consultant, but I also work part-time as a principal engineer at The Zone and also do loads of other things as well in terms of instructing video courses for Manning and O'Reilly and so on. And The Zone is a video um, sports streaming platform. Uh, we're based in the UK, but we are not live in the UK yet because you probably heard how expensive it is to get those image rights for the Premier League. And that's probably the, the main reason why we're not live in the UK yet. But otherwise, we're live uh, in eight different countries and we support over 40 different sports and 300 different leagues all around the world. In fact, when we launched in Italy a while back, I think that's about six months ago when the Italian league uh, kicked off, we accounted for something like 50% of the internet traffic that first weekend because everyone just flooded in to watch Juventus play, I imagine. And we also went live in the US with boxing. And uh, right now, as I mentioned, we are live in eight different countries and over 30 different devices. And at peak, we see around a million concurrent viewers on our platform, which as you can imagine, has got some interesting technical challenges for the team to deal with. And right now, we are using both serverless and containers very heavily to help us tackle those scalability challenges. So we have offices in London, Leeds, Katowice in Poland, as well as in Amsterdam. So for anyone who's looking for some interesting technical challenges to, to work with, uh, you know, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, we've, we are hiring in pretty much everywhere. But I'm not, I'm not actually here to talk about what I do at The Zone. Instead, I want to talk about something that I did a while back, one of our previous companies, which is a social network called uh, Yubble. And you can think of it as a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was really there that I learned an awful lot about Lambda and what it takes to run a service application in production. So when I joined Yubble back in April 2016, we, like many people, had a monolithic system, which is very simple on paper when you look at it from like 30,000 view. But once you look inside the code, you find lots of hidden complexities and problems just hidden away in those couple of lines of code that you don't see from a high level. And six months later, and the peak with uh, six developers, we arrived at an architecture that is both uh, event-driven and uh, service-oriented, and Lambda was a centerpiece that glued everything together. Now you look at this, you might think, well, that just looks very complicated. So the good question would be, why did you guys decide to do this? Why was it necessary for you to, do, to take on this huge undertaking? Well, firstly, it's, even though it looks complicated on paper, it's actually just surfacing a lot of the underlying complexities already at the top level. So all of those complexities, they were already there in the monolith. It just, you just don't see them because they're hidden away in these different lines of code. In terms of the why, we were early age uh, social networks, so our baseline traffic is pretty low, but we did manage to attract a few influencers from other platforms like Instagram and uh, what are the other things that the hipsters use, I guess. <laughs> so these guys, they have a big influence in terms of our traffic pattern. Even though, so Emily, she was one of our biggest users. At the time, she had something like 50,000 followers when the whole platform had about 800,000 users in total. And the people like Emily, they would run campaigns on our platform. She would write a post and say, hey guys, vote on this post and I'll announce a lucky winner for this beautiful designer handbag at 10 o'clock tonight. So you're sitting there looking at your dashboard all the way through the day, it's nice and steady, low traffic, nothing's happening, and you know what's gonna happen at 10 o'clock, right? Just kabam! All of a sudden, you see this massive spike in traffic, which is, when you're, when you're thinking about a backend engineer, it's really hard for you to provision for this kind of unpredictable spikes in traffic all the way throughout the day. Just basically, whenever influencers decide to run a campaign on your platform. And to make matters worse, because we're running everything on EC2, and we probably know how long it takes EC2 instances to, to well, for autoscaler to react, get a new instance, and then that instance needs to bootstrap and all that. So it takes about 10, 15 minutes before the instance can actually start serving traffic behind the load balancer. 
So to deal with uh, intraday small spikes, so some of the bigger spikes we see, we have to leave a lot of room in our cluster. So that means uh, we are running a very low CPU level by design, and we tend to scale up a lot earlier than we like as well. I think the standard you see nowadays is that people are scaling up at around 70% CPU. We were scaling up around 40%. And when you put the two things together, it means that we are spending a lot of money on resources that we are just not using at all. And to make matters even worse, at the time, the whole system had to go up and down when we do a deployment. And deployment was taking something like 30 minutes with no sort of loading screen or maintenance screen. So when you're trying to use the app during a deployment, all you get is the buffer phase, the, you know, nothing's happening. And feature was taking months to develop, which nowadays is clearly not good enough. One of my favorite speakers, Dan North, once said that the lead time to someone saying thank you is the only reputational metric that matters to us. And it's a message that really resonated with me has, and has ever, ever since stuck with me. But for us as engineers to get a thank you we need, we need to first provide value to someone. And that means we have to ship our software. And until our software is shipped, as far as the users are concerned, we haven't done anything at all. So back to the reason of why do we do all of that work. The motivation wasn't, the motivation to take this drastic overhaul of architecture and approach was first and foremost to deliver a better product, one that our users would love to use. And as a team, we love to be able to do things faster, to be able to deliver value to our customers a lot quicker than we have been. And as a company, we want us to be more cost efficient. The goal is not to spend less per se, but to spend better. If something is expensive, but it returns, it gives you a lot of value, that's absolutely fine, my book. But what I'm not happy with is, uh, is having lots of waste, things that we spend money on but not actually using. I want to improve our return on investment. And once the why is clear to us, we need to decide on the how are we going to do this. We need to decide, we need to figure out what a good architecture would look like to us before we actually go and try to build it. So I sat down with the team when we decided that in terms of the architecture, from the deployment point of view, we want everything, every deployment to be small, to be fast. We don't want to have any downtime. And we also don't want to be in a situation where we have to do lockstep deployment with the client team because the sheer amount of coordination and headache that's involved. In terms of features, we want them to be loosely coupled so that each component can evolve at its own pace. And we also don't want to be evolving at the pace of the slowest moving component. So having a loosely coupled system is going to help us with that, and also having every system being able to de be deployed independently as well. And again, we want to be cost efficient, and we want to cut down on the amount of fat that we had in our AWS bill, and there was plenty of it. We also want to minimize the amount of time that we spend just babysitting the infrastructure. As far as I'm concerned, the infrastructure, the infrastructure should just work. It should work for me, not the other way around. And we also want to have to reduce the amount of technical mess that we are dealing with, and that's a very constant choice of wording there, mess. A lot of people talk about technical debt, but something, for something to be a debt, one has to make a conscious decision at one point or another to take some shortcut now so that you can deliver quicker right away, but with a plan to pay it back later. That's how debt works, right? You've got to pay something now, but you have to pay it back somehow later on, and you've got to know how to plan to do that. But what we had wasn't that. It was just a lot of time. It just really bad at the design system. But whilst we address all this technical mess, we also don't want to take six months out and rebuild the whole system while not delivering any value. In fact, we want to deliver value faster than we've ever done before. So with those why in mind, we decided on, uh, on a microservices architecture that's built on top of, uh, built as a set of loosely coupled services on top of a set of shared events. And since we're not an infrastructure company, so as the way I see it is that the time we spend on managing our infrastructure is time away from doing the things that, are, that will actually make our customers happy. So serverless is pretty good uh, fit in terms of that direction that we want to move towards where we want to have a small team and we don't want to waste our time just managing the infrastructure. So this talk is specifically about what? What do we actually do to get there? And for those of you who may have noticed uh, that this circle is actually the golden circle from, uh, if, and if you haven't met, read uh, Simon Sinek's book, uh, Start With Why, you definitely should, it's great. So at the end, we have something like almost 200 Lambda functions running in production, and even though cost wasn't our main driver for going down this route, 
we still managed to have a pretty, pretty significant saving compared to what we were spending on EC2 because we were able to cut out all the waste that we had associated with the amount of resources that we were paying for and not using on EC2 instances. But more importantly for me, we went from doing four to six production deployments a month in April to easily doing over 100 a month in October with the same size team. We didn't have to hire up many, many people just to be able to go faster. We just make everyone more productive by taking away the things that gets in the way of them doing the things that they need to do to make our customers happy. And features took days instead of a month to deliver. And sometimes they were, we would discuss the feature with a product team. We would implement it, test it, and deliver it to production in the same day. So for the moment, we decided that Lambda serverless is a very good fit for the direction that we, we want to move in and the, the, the point that we can actually safely run production, um, uh, Lambda functions in production, there's a bunch of questions that we need to be able to answer as well. How are we going to do CI, CD? How are we going to do testing these functions that are only hosted in the cloud? And what about logging, monitoring, alerting, and so on? The basic things you need to be able to do to be able to run a system in production. And as our architecture expanded to include more and more Lambda functions as part of different services, many of which have interdependencies as well, we also need to answer a bunch of other questions around how are we going to do distributed tracing, what about conflict management and security, and so on. So all of this is super interesting to me. I spend a lot of time talking about those and also writing about them as well. But they're also not what I'm here to talk about today. I've done many talks in the previous talks. And I also put together a video course with Manning specifically to cover these, kind of, uh, these, these topics. So feel free to check it out afterwards. But instead, what I want to do today is talk about how we use serverless to essentially rebuild our entire architecture. And one of the first and most important thing we did <coughs> Excuse me, was to change the legacy monolith so that it will recall all state changes as events and publish them into a Kinesis stream. And this event driven approach is great for composability and allows us to build systems in a very loosely coupled way. And Lambda is then the glue that helps us compose all, different, all these different services together. So in this case, Kinesis is our sync for all the different events. And where we have different services, most of them are REST APIs implemented with API Gateway and Lambda. Whenever something interesting happens in those APIs, they will publish them as events into the Kinesis stream, which can then be used to trigger other services so that other services can then react to those events through, so again, Lambda functions. They, depending on what the service actually needs to do, some of them will write data to DynamoDB, maybe get their own, uh, um, their own copy of the data. Others might send out message real-time updates to the client via WebSocket using the Amazon IoT service you see on the bottom left there. And again, when these services react to the events, they do something interesting, and uh, they, make some stone, they, they make their own state changes, they also report them back as events back into the Kinesis stream so that other services can then react to those events now. So this is a pretty great way for building systems in a very loosely coupled way. And here, by, here you are breaking your system into microservices, each one of them with their own boundary context, and when you do need to cross over those boundary contexts so that one system needs to tell another one, hey, I've done the thing, please do your thing now. Instead of having those services talking to each other directly through some synchronous API call, for example, you can then, uh, make them, uh, you can then do, do them in a loosely couple ways through events where everyone just look after what happens inside their own boundary context and publish events, changes, uh, state changes to the stream so that others can listen in and do their own thing as well. The idea is, of course, it's not new with serverless. It's been around for a very long time. Databases had the same idea with uh, transaction logs. And in, this, in, the, in the case in the uh, world of uh, distributed systems, you also have a similar idea called uh, um, uh, unified log processing. And I love event-driven architectures. And it's definitely my preferred way of building systems nowadays. But it's also by no means a silver bullet. It solves some problems but it also comes with its own baggage and complexities as well. And there are also cases where I just think they are actually pretty poor fit for the problem that we try to solve. When you have uh, this, all these systems all publishing and consuming events from this Kinesis stream, one common problem they run into is how do you manage updates to your contracts for the events? 
to make sure that you don't accidentally break some other system that is relying on the events that you are publishing into the stream. Up to now, I have mostly just rely on discipline and uh, never introduced uh, breaking changes, but again, it's, it's far from a bulletproof, and it's hard to maintain that as you grow the team. And it's still very much early days, but I really like uh, what the Async API guys are trying to do in terms of giving you a way to, to specify your contract and test that you, your changes haven't changed those, API, uh, those uh, messaging contracts that uh, other people may be depending on. Another common mistake I find is that when you're trying to implement a workflow inside a given boundary context using events, in this case, I find you end up with a, with a system where debugging is quite difficult, and you are essentially inviting unnecessary complexity around logging and tracing, as well as end-to-end -end -end reporting becomes very difficult because the workflow itself doesn't exist as a standalone concept in your system. It's the abstract sum of the different parts that all just doing its own thing. And the workflow only comes together inside the mental model that you have for the system inside your head. So instead, I think for workflows, you should prefer to use a workflow engine such as the step functions, which allows you to capture the workflow explicitly and also gives you more control around retries, error handling, and branching, and so on. The trade-off here, one of the main trade-offs here is uh, cost, because one million state transitions in step functions is going to cost you $25, which is quite a bit more than what you would pay for the lambda functions that are getting triggered as part of the state machine. And as your state changes, uh, as you make state changes as part of your workflow, also don't forget to publish them back as events into the stream so that other systems can then also react to those state changes again. So we're still doing microservices and we are doing it in a very event-driven way. How do we actually organize our functions into GitHub repository? And this is a question that I get asked all the time. Do you then put everything, all of your functions, into one gigantic model repo? In which case, uh, we're, you know, there's going to be pros and cons with this model repo approach, which is beyond what I like to talk about today, because also because it's not the path that we decided to go down on. But I did write a poster for Lumigo recently to explain the difference between the model repo approach with the approach of having one repo per service. I'll share the slides afterwards so you guys can check out the post. But one thing I do want to touch on is that even if you do choose to go down the mono repo approach, it doesn't mean that you have to put all the functions inside one CloudFormation stack. And well, you can't because you're going to hit the 200 resource limit with CloudFormation anyway. So, and the, the approach we decided to go with was have one repo per service. And this is still the same approach that we use at the zone. And to help me identify my service boundaries within my system, here's a quick mind map of the, of the social network Yabo. And here you can quickly identify a number of distinct features in the system, such as the timeline feature, which is pretty much like what you will find in any other social network, like Twitter or Facebook. And then there's also search, um, notifications, suggestion, chat, and so on. And all these features that your system offer is a good starting point for you to start to identify those service boundaries. And all these features all evolve around a number of entities or concepts within your domain, like users or relationships or content and so on. And all of these guys can be used to define your service boundaries. Maybe each one will be rep uh, represented and managed by a separate microservice and implemented using the most appropriate set of technologies, like databases, uh, queues, and streams, whether you use Lambda or they use ECS. And for example, for, to store the relationship data between different users in a way that also makes it easy to do complex queries like finding second or third degree connections or finding people in your extended network that share the same interests as you, then you may want to consider using a graph database such as Neo4j or Amazon's uh, Neptune database. In this case, uh, every service, we, uh, we give it a, a separate repo, and all the functions that have to work together as part of that, that service also belongs together inside the same GitHub repo as well. And every service is going to get its own, well, therefore every repo is also going to get its own CI CD pipeline. And all the functions are deployed together as a single stack. And if there are other resources like DynamoDB tables that 
are only used and relevant to that particular service, then we also often include them as part of the same stack as well. And you'll find that with the serverless framework as well with SAM, you can also specify other resources besides your function and deploy them as part of the same cloud, uh, cloud formation stack. We can then use a strangler pattern to incrementally move features to the new system piece by piece. And search was the first one we did. It was uh, isolated, it was easy to do, and managed to implement the whole thing and deploy it to production in uh, just a couple of days. And it was able to give it, well, and we were able to use it to give us feedback on our approach and guide us towards how we approach the rest of our migration. And in this case, when I joined the company, they already had the search feature. It was implemented using one big regex query against uh, MongoDB, which, as you can imagine, just didn't scale very well at all. In fact, we were running into performance issues when the system had about 200,000 users, which is very small when, compared to, when, when, when you can consider the fact that, as a social network, we want to be aiming for millions and millions of users in the system. So, as I mentioned earlier, the first thing we did was make sure the legacy system is publishing all state changes as events. So in this case, I can have a Lambda function that reacts to, say, user registration and whenever a user updates their profile or whenever a user follows another, one, another user. Then we can, use those, uh, we can process those events and use them to update a user index inside um, uh, Amazon's uh, Cloud Search. And in this case, I have another Lambda function which can then expose the data as an API to give you a new search API that you can use to search users by first name, last name, and username, and so on, and also supports things like a fuzzy search and so on. Um, because we want to deliver value to our customers quickly, we don't want to have to wait for the client team to update their code to start using the new service. So as part of our migration strategy, what we normally do is that when we publish a new service, we also update the existing monolith to proxy the current endpoint to hit the new system instead, so that when the, the, the client team is ready to migrate to a new service, they will update their own code, but we don't have to wait for them to, um, to, to catch up. We also built a new analytics pipeline pretty soon after that. At the time, we were using Mixpanel, and for some reason, they had signed a contract for the top tier uh, plan, even though the company was just starting out, so there's not that much data. And one of the things you also find with Mixpanel is that, whilst it's very good at tracking generic app events, like, oh, how many people were signed in the last day, it doesn't understand our social graph. So we can't ask questions such as, um, tell me how many people signed up, uh, signed up in the last uh, seven days who also followed uh, Tiny Temper, who we just attracted from a different platform. And also our BI guy just didn't know how to work with the J uh, JavaScript-based uh, query language that Mixpanel had as well. Unfortunately, we have all the events in Kinesis, so we can just slap another Lambda function to listen to those events, and in this case, we live stream them to Google BigQuery, which allows you to run ad hoc queries against exabyte size data set and still return results within a few seconds. And also, it's pay per use, so you only get charged for data that BigQuery actually processes when you run your query. So this work took several iterations, but the first version went from a discussion to actually running production within two days. And this was for one of the guys who's never really used AWS or Lambda in, in the past. So this was pretty good um, achievement for, for him. And our BI guy came to us afterwards and said, Jesus, guys, nothing ever got done this fast at Skype, which, of course, no offense to anyone from Skype here. But it just goes back to the, the point that your lead time is someone being to say thank you or the, the lead time to you delivering value to someone is the, is the thing that we should be optimized ourselves towards. And even though cost wasn't our primary reason for doing all of this work, it's still great to see that our new solution was significantly cheaper, but also at the same time delivered a lot more value to our users, to our, our product team as well. And since then, the Amazon also announced the Athena service at reInvent 2016 as a direct competition to BigQuery. And uh, if I were to do all this uh, all over again today, I will just use Amazon Athena. And I'll keep the Kinesis as my sync, and I'll use the uh, Kinesis Firehose to do, to collect and batch Kinesis events and then dump them into S3 as my data lake, and then I can set up a crawler for, uh, for AWS Glue, who would then analyze the data I have in my S3 bucket, figure out the schema, and catalog them into a table that I can use 
to run ad hoc queries in with Athena, and Athena-like group BigQuery is able to analyze a huge amount of data and still return value return results within a few seconds, and it's also paper use. And from there, I can also integrate with QuickSight, which allows me to create dashboards to visualize, uh, I guess, query, uh, query results from Athena, and it's a great way for me to show those high-level business metrics, such as uh, revenue, engagement, et cetera, et cetera. And also, QuickSight nowadays is also pay-per-use as well. And the best thing about all of that is I don't have to write a single line of code myself. It's just provision a few AWS resources with CloudFormation or Terraform or whatever, and I've got a system that is paper use and that can allow me to track user, capture user events and report them in a nice BI dashboard uh, to show to my uh, product team in a, in a way that's both cost efficient but also very, very easy to do as well. Or you take just some CloudFormation template. And we also have this uh, timeline feature that I mentioned earlier, which is, works just the same way as uh, the Twitter's timeline. Except the first implementation just, well, largely didn't work. And um, at, least not in, at, least, at least it didn't work in the way that it was designed. There was a detailed spec that was written for how it should work, and the QA team had a detailed test plan for everything, except that somehow the implementation just failed every single test, which I didn't think was possible. And it also, was also pretty much, uh, well, very over-engineered. Um, how over-engineered? Well, it was using events, so you separate the act of you posting a new content to delivering it to your followers, which is great, but uh, it was processing events using this weird uh, abstraction whereby I have to have modules with names from one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10, and the order and name of the files matter because the handler module will iterate through them by file name, which just as I'm talking about it now, it still doesn't make any more sense to me than it did the two years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and also, it just didn't scale. Every post, every event that comes in to add a new post to my timeline have to reconstruct my entire timeline, which, as you can imagine, just super inefficient. And to make things even more interesting, a new CPU had to come in and uh, basically just fired the whole fire the entire team that was involved. So, me, I came in with a few other guys, and we didn't, for better or worse, we didn't have anyone that we can ask to see why it was designed like that in the first place. And instead of reverse engineering a system that didn't quite you know, fit the purpose, we sat down with the product team to understand what it is that they actually wanted from this feature. And we, decided, we went about building it from scratch again, uh, again, on top of events. In this case, we have... Um, Events from the Lexus system that whenever you post some content or whenever you follow someone, those are events are published into Kinesis streams. So we can now have Lambda functions that react to those events. In the case of you creating a new content, one of the functions, uh, creating a new post, one of the functions will react to that and you will look for your followers and then group your followers into batches of say a thousand and then for every batch, send a message into SNS which would then trigger another Lambda function to then actually take your post and add it to your followers' feed, which is stored as a sorted set in, the, in, the Redis, um, in Redis inside Elasticsearch, sorry, Elastic Cache. And the reason why we proxy through SNS in this case is because we can leverage, with SNS and Lambda, you can leverage the built-in retry mechanism whereby if a Lambda function fails for whatever reason, then it gets two retries out of the box, and then it also gets the DataQ support out of the box as well. In this particular case, we want to optimize for worst case scenario, because like every social network, you're gonna find that 95% of users are gonna have barely any followers, but then you're gonna have those outliers that are like 5% of users that's gonna have hundreds of thousands of followers or millions of followers. And the expensive piece of work here in the worst case scenarios is if trying to, so trying to process all, say a million inserts into Elastic uh, Cache fails, then you have to do the expensive work of fetching a million followers out of the database for this particular user again. So by processing things through SNS, it allows us to fail individual batches without having to repeat the expensive piece of work in the worst case scenario. And as we normally do, we will, once we have a data in the data source that we want to use, we can then put in the Lambda function behind API Gateway and expose it as a new API. And as part of our migration strategy, we then also proxy the existing endpoints 
to hit the new system until the, uh, the client team is able to catch up and update the app so that uh, they will call the new API directly, in which case we can then to retire those old endpoints from the monolith. In this case, for this particular service, you see all these functions here, they all work together, they form a cohesive unit to they have to work together to deliver the actual feature itself that we wanted, so they're also in the same repo and de deployed together as well. Another small but important detail I want to point out here is that I try to, so I use the service framework, and as part of that, my service, so YAML, I can, I can give the service a name, and I try to keep that name consistent with the name of the repo, so that when your function gets deployed, the service framework enforces the naming convention that puts the service name at the front, so I can very easily see in my Lambda console all the functions that are related to this uh, same uh, timeline API, and also from that I can figure out what's the repo I need to look at to look at the code. And like every other social network, we also have a recommendation feature, which unfortunately our implementation also didn't work, at least not in the way that you expect them to. Uh, because it, and I can get this, it returns the first 30 people from the database by account creation time as recommendation, which is just... <laughs> <laughs> so it's great if you work for Yabo, so your name is going to pop up in that list all the time, uh, but as a feature, it's just not very useful for anyone else who is trying to find people that they may be interested in, in following. So again, we decided to rebuild it from the ground up by consuming events. In this case, uh, because all of our state changes are already recorded in BigQuery and I can have a Lambda function run a query against uh, you know, all this data we ha already have using a formula that basically applies the time decay to events that's happening in the last 24 hours so that someone following you the last hour will count more than someone who followed you, say, eight hours ago, and the someone who's uh, liked your content will count more towards your, you know, how trendy you are in the platform than someone who liked your content, say, eight hours ago. And then we can run this query against Google BigQuery and store the current set of trending users in DynamoDB, and then we can expose the data as using API Gateway and Lambda again. So now we have API that you can, you can call to get back the people that are currently trending on the platform. And every time you follow or unfollow someone, those events are also listened to by a Lambda function, who in this case will update a social graph in, uh, in the, uh, which is in GraphineDB, which is a hosted version of Neo4j, so where we can then very easily run the complex queries against the social graph to find, say, your second or third degree connection. So people that are followed by the people that you follow or people that follow the people that follow you and so on. And to give you more meaningful suggestions for people that you may want to follow, we also updated the legacy endpoint to instead of returning the first 30 people by account creation time, we would make a request to both new APIs, amalgamate the results together, doing some randomization and the hydration, and then return you people that you may actually be interested in following because you have shared connections inside a social graph. And the nice thing about all of this is that I kind of did just did it or the whole thing in one night because uh, I had trouble sleeping. And um, didn't ship it in the same day, but... <laughs> And the last thing I want to talk about today is uh, how we also went about building a scalable system for sending out push notifications to our users, which we talked about Mixpanel earlier. And it, interestingly, it's also one of the things that you can ask Mixpanel to do, but again, it doesn't understand our social graph. So we can't ask it to target users the same the way that we actually want it to. And uh, also, it's just not worth paying $3,000 a month for just doing uh, push notifications from time to time. And since we're capturing all these events in Google BigQuery already, and it's such a powerful engine to run ad hoc queries and against a large amount of data, so the idea was, well, why don't we just build a system on top of data we already have in Google BigQuery and use that to drive our ad hoc notifications, which is often uh, gets pushed by the marketing team who want to target, say, followers for an influencer when the influencer publishes new content on a platform. 
or to do schedule notifications, which is something that the product team really wanted, so that you can run, say, uh, send out notification, push notifications on day, uh, on day one for people who didn't finish the, um, the whole sign-up process, or if someone who has uh, lapsed for 21 days, then we send a message to say, hey, here are some of the things that you've missed. Please come back and uh, log in uh, and see what's happened. Um, we also want to be able to do A-B testing or for the messaging, uh, messaging itself, but also the layout as well. And we want to be able to do, well, in this case, it's more it's just multivariant testing using a control group, and we want to be able to easily control the percentage of different users that we target. And of course, we want this system to be scalable, to be able to send out push notifications to millions of users regularly, and we also want it to be cost-effective as well. Again, the idea is not to spend less, but to spend better. And for the, for the schedule notifications, again, we have a cron job. Essentially, it's a CloudWatch event that triggers a Lambda function that runs a query against, the Dynamo, against the Google BigQuery, identify all the users that we want to target, and then spit out a JSON manifest, essentially, and put into an S3 bucket so that that can trigger another Lambda function, who in this case will talk to um, was it? I forgot their name now. Google's uh, cloud messaging and uh, Apple's uh, APN, which is Apple's uh, uh, Apple's push notification system as well. So now, essentially, we're setting, we are separating the, the different fe uh, different functionalities that decides on what uh, who you want to target and how you're going to send out the push notification themselves, which then allows other processes to then also review the same feature or be able to send out push notifications from other parts of the system. And the good question is, uh, why do we end up using this, uh, talking to the, uh, to the uh, mobile platform directly, as opposed to doing this through SNS? Most of the reason is just because that uh, when we built the app the first time, we didn't have integration with SNS. And when we actually came to the time to actually figure out how we're going to implement this new feature, we decided that it just, SNS just didn't give us enough. From the backend's perspective, we're still doing more or less the same amount of work, and also from the front end, there's also additional integration that's involved between the client and the SNS service as well. And for the ad hoc, uh, for the ad hoc notifications that we want to send out uh, that are driven by the, uh, by the marketing team, we also have to deal with uh, in terms of this, this friction, or this, this uh, I guess conflict between having oversight and uh, also having a process that doesn't add too much friction, because we want the marketing team to be able to do their thing, to do their job well, but at the same time, product team is concerned with letting the product team, this marketing team, just go wild and then start sending out lots and lots of spam to our, to our customers. So the product team is concerned with maintaining the user experience, whereas the marketing team has an agenda to push for better and to, to drive for usage and, uh, and the engagement. So the system we decided on was to uh, have uh, the marketing team work with the BI analysts to work on the, uh, the uh, big Google BigQuery that will identify and target the right users, and then there's some approval process that gets uh, sent to the uh, CPO or and the CTO, and once the, once the approval, gets, uh, um, once approval is, is done, then we then actually send out the notifications. In this case, I basically put together a very simple single page application uh, for the marketing team to use, which basically allows them to log on, work, and, uh, paste in the Google BigQuery query that they worked out with the, with the BI analyst, and uh, you know, explain what this message is for, and then send out a, a message for the, that's actually going to get translated into a notification on the device. And that gets uh, sent out to the approvers, the chief product officer and the CTO, by SES, we use SES to send an email to the approver as well as the requester, whereby they can see, based on the query that we run, how many people is going to be targeted by this particular message, what it's going to look like, and there's going to be a button for the, uh, for the, for the approver to approve, reject, and to send themselves a test message to see how it actually looks on the device. And based on what the approver decides to do, we would then trigger a Lambda function to either approve or reject the request, and in the case when the request was approved, then we will run the query in, uh, in the BigQuery again, generate the JSON manifest, upload it into the S3 bucket we saw earlier to trigger the Lambda function to then actually send out the push notifications, which again is the same process that's also used by the schedule notifications, and those are actually three separate microservices that are all working together. So in this particular case, those are three separate repos with its own deployment stack. 
So those are just some examples of the work that we're able to do very quickly as part of our migration to uh, this new serverless uh, architecture. And what we found was that the system was more scalable and also scales up a lot faster. And because we don't have to pay for all that idle resources on EC2, we also find the system to be a lot cheaper as well. And since by default, Lambda deployed to three, model, three availability zones after the box, we also have a system that's more resilient without us having to do anything ourselves and pay for all these additional redundancies because we need to have a system that, that, that can withstand one AZ going down. And since Amazon is now looking after the security of our operating system as well as networking, and they can do a much better job than, than I can for sure, it also means that our system as a whole is more secured as well. So as far as DevOps is concerned, we get a lot of things just out of the box without us having to do anything. In return, we get this super highway between having an idea and being able to push something out into production and be able to start testing the idea against the market. And that's important because my job as an engineer for a social network company is to deliver business value quickly and to do so in a way that's both cost efficient and also, and that means that and my job is not to manage infrastructure and serverless is great because it lets me focus on the things that are actually important to us as a business. So with that, uh, thank you guys very much for your time and, uh, and uh, I guess, uh, do we have some time for questions? Yes, we do. Cool. You are bang on time. Uh, actually, round of applause first. <laughs> Okay, who's first? Hi, really interesting talk. How important was it to have clear definition of your bounded context ahead of time? Because it seems without that, that there's quite a lot of scope for creating a, a bit of a mess. I think that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the lucky thing for us is that we had a monolith already, so we already knew what the, how the system is being used, so that when it comes to slicing up the system into different boundary contacts, it was, it's not something that we could, you know, we are just doing guesswork. We actually knew how the system was being used. And I think that's such a good thing that for, for anyone to do, is uh, don't go straight to microservices, always start with monolith. Learn the system first before you decide how to slice it up. And of course, uh, you're going to make mistakes, and sometimes the, different, uh, the, uh, the binding context will also shift as well as you introduce new features, in which case that became something that you had to manage in terms of how do you then deploy a separate service, then how to then do the migration so that you know, some of those uh, overlapping features are then moved from one boundary context to another. Um, there's, I guess uh, there's no, I guess I don't have a, you know, a for, formula for that, but just something that I've worked out on every single case. But yeah, always start from one of them. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, that's uh, Great talk, man, it's good. Um, you were talking about broadcasting, well, um, listening to an, a feed of events from your servers um, instead of using Mixpal which is, I think it's a great suggestion. Um, I ran into problems when I tried doing that because I couldn't see kind of user, inter user interface interactions. So like somebody would swipe to a tab and be confused and swipe back. So the marketing team would want to know about those sorts of things don't have a natural sort of back end interaction. Um, did you get that kind of problem or did I miss something? Sorry, uh, what, what could you not see? So uh, say I've got an app, a mobile yeah. phone app, yeah. and the user kind of like swipes to a different tab. There's no, yeah. inter there's no natural ah, interaction with the back end. Right. Yeah, that. Yes, so we don't just record the service side events. So the service side event is just for the state changes that we are, you know, as a service, as, um, as the services are introducing. But we also record the uh, client side events so that the client would then also publish events into our backend system. So we have a separate stream to capture those, which also then gets published into the same uh, Google BigQuery sort of, um, data set different tables, but uh, so you have different table for the user interactions. So those we, we, we also record. So at the time, we actually had um, a separate endpoint that for the user to publish those, uh, for the client app to publish those events into. Uh, but nowadays, uh, now that I've spoken to a few people, I've watched up a little bit, that uh, I actually think it's much better instead of implementing this thing yourself, just let the client talk to Kinesis directly and just using something like Cognito to give them uh, exchange your OAuth to token for a temporary AWS credential that just have the permission to write events into that particular Kinesis stream. So that would be a much better way for you to you know, make, build your system without having to, because all our function was doing and API was doing was authentication. Thanks very much.
Anyone else? I think that's it. That's it. Right, another round of applause, please. <laughs>